Hi everyone, um, thank you for joining us today for the last session of the day. Um, I'm Amen, I'm the GCSE Chemistry Tutor. If you've been here before, we've done lots of um, sessions already. Today we'll be covering dynamic equilibrium and altering conditions. So if you've been um, with me this week, you know we've been looking at rates of reaction um, and collision theory. And then yesterday um, we started looking at dynamic equilibrium. So we're hopefully going to tackle that topic today. Um, and then if we've got time, do a recap of, of everything that we've covered this week. Just to let you know, um, this session will be for an hour. Um, so we'll be finishing at 4.15. Um, and it is the last session of this week because tomorrow is a bank holiday. If you haven't met me before, as I said, my name's Aman um, and I study medicine at King's College London and I've done lots of lessons with my tutor. Um, so as the sessions usually run, if you've got any questions at all, just pop them into the chat function as we're going through and I'll try and answer them. You can also pop them into the Q&A um, and there is some time at the end as well for any Q&A questions. But if you've got any throughout, I will try and answer them for you as we go along. Um, if not any questions now, then we'll get started. So as I said, today we'll be looking at dynamic equilibrium um, and the altering conditions. So today's specific learning objectives, hopefully we're going to understand what Le, Ch Le Chatelier's principle is, sorry, um, and then explain the effects of concentration, pressure and temperature are on equilibrium. So we've looked at a couple of those effects on um, collision theory and the rates of reaction, but today we'll be looking specifically at their effects on equilibrium. And then finally, trying to apply all of the knowledge that we've learned this week to a range of exam questions. Um, just to say that I'm doing exam questions kind of throughout the session today. So all of the questions that will appear on the screen are exam questions, um, even if they don't look like the usual style that we do. Um, they have all come from the three main exam boards, so AQA, Edexcel and OCR. So before we start kind of looking at new content, just a quick recap of what we covered yesterday with regards to dynamic equilibrium. Hopefully um, you remember that when we think about dynamic equilibrium, it's always in a closed system. So that's the most important thing. And closed system means that neither the reactants nor products can get in or get out. So effectively it's in kind of almost like a closed box. Um, so if we imagine here, this reaction between hydrogen and iodine producing hydrogen iodide, that hydrogen gas can't escape um, and nothing else can get in either. So um, when we reach equilibrium at this kind of balancing point, there will be no change in the amount of products and reactants. So equilibrium doesn't mean that the amounts of products and reactants are equal. It means that there's no change in the amount of products and reactants. Um, so if you go on to study this at A level, you'll learn a bit about the equilibrium constant and what that means. It's not a GCSE topic, but that explains how the reactants and products change with regards to their amounts. So it's important you don't say that they are equal. You just say that there's no change in the amount of products and reactants at equilibrium. But the key um, kind of phrase they like you to use at GCSE is that at equilibrium, the rate of the forward and the reverse reaction are equal. So hopefully you remember that yesterday um, we went through reversible reactions and remember at equilibrium, it's reversible reactions that we're thinking about because it's the rate of the forward and the reverse reaction that are equal. So any reactions that aren't reversible will not have an equilibrium state because there is no reverse reaction. So um, the first part of the new kind of content we're going to cover today is um, Le Chatelier's principle. So this is him over here. Um, and he said that if we change the conditions of a reaction at equilibrium, the position of equilibrium shifts to counteract that change. So what that means is that at equilibrium, everything's balanced. Um, but if we change the conditions of a reaction, that balance is going to move. Instead of being completely balanced, it might move more towards one side of the reaction than the other. And that's essentially what we're going to be looking at today. How does that um, position of equilibrium move when we look at the conditions of pressure, concentration and temperature? Now, you may be wondering why aren't catalysts on the screen? Um, and the reason for that is that catalysts increase the rate of a reaction. So they essentially all they do to equilibrium is they mean that we reach equilibrium faster. They don't change the position of equilibrium. So these factors on the screen, pressure, concentration and, temp and temperature will um, change the position of equilibrium, whereas a catalyst won't change that position. All they will do is increase the rate of reaction in the same form that we looked at um, yesterday. So hopefully you remember yesterday I showed you a video um, where we looked at what a catalyst does. And um, remember, it finds a different route, an alternative pathway for the reaction that has a lower activation energy. And that means if we've got a lower activation energy, 
less energy is required for the reaction to take place. So that means that the, um, the rate of the reaction will be quicker. Um, and that's essentially all that catalysts do with regards to equilibrium. They speed up the rate of both the forward and the reverse reactions. And so we reach equilibrium faster. OK, so let's start off with our first um, condition then, concentration. So we're going to go through this slowly and with some examples and questions, um, because usually the best way to understand these topics is to do questions. So let's start with the theory first. So concentration, first of all, we know that is um, to do with what the concentration of a solution is. So yesterday we used the example of hydrochloric acid and we said that a concentrated form of hydrochloric acid has more reactant particles in there, whereas a less concentrated form of hydrochloric acid will have less reactant particles in there. So almost a definition of concentration is how many reactant particles in the same volume. So thinking about that then, if we think about equilibrium, so we've got a balance if we increase the concentration of a reactant, equilibrium will shift in order to remove the reactant and to reform equilibrium. So if we look at this equation down here, let's say that we're at equilibrium, so we're at this balance point, and then I add in some more bromine to the reaction. That then means that because there's more bromine, the equilibrium or the system doesn't like that. It wants to have equilibrium. So to get equilibrium, it's got to remove that bromine. And to remove that bromine, the reaction has to move to the right-hand side. It has to start forming more products. Essentially, it has to use up the bromine. So what this first statement is saying is that if we increase the concentration of a reactant, equilibrium will shift to the right, to the product side, in order to almost use up that reactant and reform equilibrium. And once it's used up that reactant, equilibrium will um, be regained again. And similarly, if we decrease a product, so let's say this time um, I remove some hydrogen ions um, and from, from the system, that will then mean that we need more hydrogen ions. So again, the equilibrium will move to the right-hand side, to the product side, because we need to increase the amount of hydrogen ions. So to do that, there has to be more product formed. So when we shift equilibrium, it's all about how do we counteract a change that has happened. So if we focus on this um, equation again and think about how we can change concentrations, there's a couple of questions that at GCSE they like to ask you about, especially when you've got hydrogen ions involved. The first thing is hydrochloric acid. So if I added an acid to this, does anyone know what effect that might have on equilibrium? If not, think about the ions in hydrochloric acid. So why don't we start with that then? How, what ions are in hydrochloric acid? Anyone know what ions are in hydrochloric acid? So what makes up hydrochloric acid? Hydrogen, good, a H plus ion, well done. Um, and good, a chlorine ion. So we've got the hydrogen ions and the chlorine ions. So someone's asking me about neutralization and does it affect the pH scale? Not in this reaction, we're not really thinking about neutralization here. I'm just saying this is a common exam question that they like to ask. So if we look at this reaction here, we've already got hydrogen ions. So if we add hydrochloric acid, remember hydrochloric acid has H plus ions and chloride ions. What do you think will happen to the position of equilibrium? What are we essentially adding and therefore what do you think will happen to the position of equilibrium if I add hydrochloric acid? Is it going to move to the reactant side, the left side, or is it going to move to the right hand side, the product side? Any ideas? Brilliant, so someone's saying the reactant side. Excellent, so if I add hydrogen ions, what's going to happen is the concentration of hydrogen will increase. So if I add hydrochloric acid, because it's got hydrogen ions in it, the concentration of hydrogen will increase. And remember then, that's going to um, not be at equilibrium if we add more hydrogen ions. So we need to regain equilibrium. So essentially, we need to use up this hydrogen, this extra hydrogen that I've added. And to do that, equilibrium is going to move to the reactant side so that we can use up that hydrogen ions. So that essentially means that we're going to do the product reaction, so the reverse reaction, more of the reverse reaction, to produce more reactant and therefore regain um, equilibrium. So it's all about counteracting um, that change. So everyone that said reactant side, well done. 
So we've added acid. What if I now add an alkali? So for example, what if I add sodium hydroxide? So in sodium hydroxide, we've got Na plus ions and hydroxide ions. Neither of those are in the equation, but any ideas what might happen if I add a hydroxide ion? I don't want to know what's going to happen to the um, position of equilibrium. I just want to know what might, what might those hydroxide ions do? What do hydroxide ions like to react with? What did we cover last week? So yep, hydroxide ions are alkalis. They're part of, that's how we kind of the defi definition of alkali. Excellent, so someone's saying hydroxide's made of hydrogen and oxygen, okay. But remember the ion in the equation is a hydrogen ion. Hydroxide, uh, the ion is OH. Any ideas? Okay, so last week we covered um, neutralization. Oh, excellent, someone's just said neutralize the hydrogen ion. That's really good. So hydroxide ions, when we add them in, if you remember when we do acids and alkalis and we react them in a titration calculation, hydroxide ions react with hydrogen to produce H2O or water. So hydroxide ions react with hydrogen to produce water. So if I add an alkali, to the hydroxide uh, to the hydrogen ions essentially it's going to use up the hydrogen ions so if it uses up the hydrogen ions there will be less hydrogen ions so now that we know that the hydroxide ions the oh minus will use up the hydrogen ions where do we think the position of equilibrium will move so essentially we're going to have less hydrogen ions what do we need to do to counteract that change do we need to move it to the left and have more reactants or do we need to move it to the right and have more products? What do we think? Good, equilibrium moves to the right. So when we add in a hydroxide, it's going to use up the hydrogen. So we essentially need to move the equilibrium position to the right to create more hydrogen. Excellent, well done everyone. Okay, so they're the two common things um, that exam questions will tend to ask about with regards to concentration. It's adding an acid and an alkali. So for example, if in a reaction we had hydroxide ions involved um, and not hydrogen ions, that would mean the exact opposite of what we've covered today. So if we added in the alkali, the position of equilibrium will move to the side with less alkali. And if we added in hydrochloric acid, um, the position of equilibrium will move to the side with the hydroxide ions because we need to create hydroxide ions. Um, someone's asking me about um, equilibrium and um, how when you work out the equilibrium, do you have to do the opposite? So essentially, that's what it is. We're trying to counteract a change. We're trying to do the opposite of what's happened. So for example, when I added in bromine, because I've added in bromine, I don't want any more bromine. I want to use it up. So instead of, if we imagine then, when I add in bromine, the position of equilibrium is, let's say, here, because I've added in bromine. I want the position of equilibrium to move back to the balanced position. So that means it needs to move this way. So it moves to the right to try and counteract that change. So yeah, you can think about it as kind of an opposite effect. Um, any questions on concentration uh, before we do an exam question on it? So try not to think too much about pH scales when it comes to concentration. Um, I use it kind of to think about, I think about neutralization when we add in an acid and we've got an alkali there, um, but it's more about how the concentration changes. Okay, so let's do a question on concentration then. So we've got ethanoic acid and ethanol. They react together reversibly. Um, so this symbol here should be a reversible sign, um, but the question didn't have it. So it, they react together reversibly to form ethyl ethanoate and water. In a closed system, a dynamic equilibrium is set up. Suppose you now added some more ethanol. What effect would that have on the percentage of ethanoic acid converted into ethyl ethanoate? Explain your answer using Le Chatelier's principle. So we've got our reaction is reversible we're adding in some more ethanol what effect is that going to have on the position of equilibrium and the percentage of ethanoic acid converted into ethyl ethanoate so is more ethanoic acid going to become um, ethyl ethanoate or less ethanoic acid going to become ethyl ethanoate what do we think okay so we've got some mixed answers so i'm going to ask that again so we're adding in some ethanol the question is asking, what would happen to the percentage of ethanoic acid that is converted into ethyl ethanoate? 
will more ethanoic acid be converted into ethyl ethanoate or less ethanoic acid be converted into ethyl ethanoate? All right, so more. And the reason it's more is because we've added in ethanol. So if we add in ethanol, we want to counteract that change. We don't want there to be extra ethanol. So that means the position of equilibrium moves this way. So essentially, more ethyl ethanoate is being produced. So the percentage of ethanoic acid converted into ethyl ethanoate increases. And that's because more ethyl ethanoate has to be produced to counteract the change when we add in more ethanol. Someone's asking, does the concentration change when working out the equilibrium? Um, yeah, so you wouldn't be asked to work out an equi uh, a concentration at equilibrium. Um, that's an A-level topic. Good, so everyone that said more, really well done. Um, that's the correct answer. And to explain that using Le Chatelier's principle, all you need to say um, is that the position of equilibrium moves to the right-hand side um, to counteract the added concentration or the added ethanol um, so that equilibrium is regained. Someone's asking, what is meant by when something moves to the right or to the left? That's a really good question. So essentially, we are asking, is the position of equilibrium or is the position of the reaction moving to the left or to the right? So at equilibrium, what would happen is that we would be at the balancing point. So we would be here. Essentially, the rate of the forward reaction, and the forward reaction is ethanoic acid plus ethanol becomes ethyl ethanoate and water, that's the forward reaction, will be the same as the reverse reaction, which is water plus ethyl ethanoate becoming ethanol and ethanoic acid. But if I disrupt that equilibrium by adding in ethanol, the concentration of ethanol increases. And that means instead of the equilibrium being at the balancing point or in the middle, the equilibrium will be more on the left hand side, which isn't what we want. We want it to be in the middle. So that means we need to use up this extra ethanol and to use up that extra ethanol. It needs to react with the ethanoic acid and produce ethyl ethanoate and water. So the position of equilibrium will shift to the right hand side so that it produces more ethyl ethanoate and water and therefore counteracts the extra um, ethanol. So basically balances out the extra ethanol by producing more product. So I tend not to say it will move to the product side or the reactant side because remember they're reversible reactions. So in the forward reaction, th these are the reactants and these are the products, but in the reverse reaction, these are the reactants and these are the products. So I always say, is it going to shift to the left or shift to the right? So in this case, it would shift to the right. Um, so hopefully that makes sense. So you're basically thinking, which side of the reaction um, is equilibrium going to move on to to counteract that change? But excellent question, well done. Someone's asking, what year do you learn this? Um, so these, this is a higher tier topic. Um, so um, the actual conditions is a higher tier topic. It's a grade seven topic. You would learn this in year 11. Great, okay, so let's move on to the next condition then. So the next condition is pressure. And when we think about pressure, we're thinking that this only affects gases. So just like when we covered rates of reactions, it's only going to affect a gas. And that's really, really important um, that we appreciate that. Um, it's not going to affect liquids and it's not going to affect solids. So if we increase the, position, uh, the pressure, the position of equilibrium will move to the side with fewer moles of gas. So I'm going to pause there and just explain what moles of gas means. So let's look at this um, equation down here. Moles of gas, in this case, refers to the big numbers in front of the gases. So this is sulfur dioxide, SO2, sulfur dioxide. There are two moles of sulfur dioxide. That essentially means we have two sulfur dioxides. And oxygen, there's no number in front, that means it's just one. So we have one mole of oxygen. Remember we covered moles and masses a couple of weeks ago when we looked at calculations and we covered exactly what a mole is. Um, Essentially, in this case, we're thinking about gases and the big numbers in front. So there's two moles of sulfur dioxide, one mole of oxygen, and then we produce two moles here of um, sulfate, uh, sorry, um, sulfur, um, sulfur trioxide, sulfur trioxide there, gas. So we've got sulfur dioxide, two moles, one mole of oxygen, and two moles of sulfur trioxide. Um, this, uh, this topic is in trilogy, yes. 
Um, so the topics that we've been covering for the uh, rest of the week were core topics. This one is in the triple science. Okay, so now let's think about that reaction again. So we've got three moles in total reactants and two moles products. So three moles on the left, two moles on the right. So this statement here that says, if we increase the pressure, the position of equilibrium will move to the side with fewer moles of gas. So what do we think then? Is it gonna to move to the left or to the right? If we increase the pressure in this reaction, is the position of equilibrium going to move to the left or to the right? Okay, remember it moves to the side with fewer moles. So if we increase the pressure, it's going to move to the side with fewer moles. So there's three moles on the left, two moles on the right. So which side has got fewer moles? Great, yeah, it moves to the right, well done. So we're thinking about the moles of gases and which side has less. So whenever you do these questions, always look at how many moles on the left, how many moles on the right. And then when you um, look at the question, if it says increase the pressure, it's going to move to the side with fewer moles. And the reason for that is that if we increase the pressure of the gas, we want to reduce it. And to reduce it, we then need to um, move to the side with fewer moles of gas, and that will reduce the pressure. If we decrease the pressure, the position of equilibrium will move to the side with more moles of gas. So if I decrease the pressure of this reaction, which side is it going to move to, the left or the right? So we've got sulfur dioxide reacting with oxygen to produce sulfur um, trioxide. Which side is it going to move to if I decrease the pressure? Good, the left, well done. So it'll move to the left. And that's because there are three moles on the left, so there are more moles of gas on the left. So if we move to the left, there'll be more gas particles in the same volume, and therefore the pressure increases. Um, so well done. Now let's look at this second equation. How many moles of gas are there on the left? So how many moles of gas in hydrogen and iodine? We've had one answer come through. The person that's answered me already, they are correct. Good. Everyone's correct so far. Excellent, yep, so two moles. There's one mole of hydrogen and one mole of iodine. So there are two moles on the left. How many moles on the right? How many moles on the right? We've got two moles on the left. How many have we got on the right? Excellent, two moles on the right. And that is because there's a big two in front. So that means there are two moles on the left and two moles on the right. Um, so the person that said four, um, the reason it's not four is because we don't multiply two by the H and by the I. Um, it's just that it, there's two moles of hydrogen iodide. So you take it as one compound or one simple molecule. Remember, simple molecule because they're covalently bonded. So two moles of hydrogen iodide, one mole of hydrogen, one mole of iodine. Um, great. So if I increase the pressure in that reaction, where's equilibrium going to move to? We've got two moles on the left, two moles on the right. If I increase the pressure in that reaction, where's it going to move? Any ideas? Excellent, so someone has said nowhere. Brilliant, so the reason it moves nowhere is because we have an equal number of moles on both sides of the reaction. So if I increase the pressure, if we move the position of equilibrium, it's not going to decrease the pressure for us. It's going to stay the same. So equilibrium will stay the same. It will stay balanced. If we decrease the pressure, there's two moles on the left, two moles on the right. So again, equilibrium won't move because the pressure will stay at that equilibrium. Someone's asked me why do we move it to the side with fewer moles when we increase the pressure? And that's to do with gas particles in a volume. So remember that pressure can come from a few different things in gases. Uh, but if we think about the particles, so the more particles there are in a certain volume, um, the more the pressure increases. So usually pressure is to do with particles hitting the sides of the container, um, and that causes pressure in a container. But if we move from a side that's got three moles to a side that's got two moles, there'll be less gas particles in that same um, volume and so the moles of gas has decreased and then what that means is that there'll be less pressure in the system so it will decrease the pressure whereas if we decrease the pressure we want to increase it again so we want to increase the number of moles of gas if you add a gas to the reaction will it work like the concentration reaction 
Um, so you don't tend to add gases to the reaction, but yes, um, if you do, it reacts just like concentration because essentially you're not adding pressure when you add more gas, you're kind of increasing the concentration of that gas. Yes, good, um, well done. So if there are no more questions, let's do a question, uh, an exam question. So this is a really common exam question on the Harbour process. Um, they like to ask about this because it's one of the common reversible reactions. So um, if you do lots of exam questions on this, hopefully you'll get full marks on it because it's very common. So the Harbour process um, for the manufacture of ammonia from nitrogen and hydrogen involves this reversible reaction. So we've covered this process loads and loads of times in most of our lessons um, because it is such a common reaction. So it's nitrogen and hydrogen reacting together to produce ammonia. That is a balanced equation and we've got the reversible reaction sign. So the question is, what would be the effect on the position of equilibrium if you increased the pressure? So I'll give you a minute or two to think about this. If we increase the pressure, where does, position, um, where does the position of equilibrium move and why? So use it, um, explain your answer using Le Chatelier's principle. There's no rush. So where does the position of equilibrium move and why? Okay, so we've had one answer come through. Um, you're right, good. Just wait for a few more answers. Great, so everyone that sent me an answer so far, um, you're exactly correct. Well done. Yep, so the position of equilibrium will move to the right hand side. And the reason for that is that there are fewer moles of gas. So on the left hand side, there are four moles, one mole of nitrogen, three moles of hydrogen. So three plus one is four. And on the right, there are two moles. So that means if we increase the pressure, the position of equilibrium will move to the right hand side to decrease the pressure because there'll be fewer moles of gas. So well done everyone. Any questions on pressure before we move on to the next condition? Okay, so the last altering condition is about temperature. Um, someone's asking, does this theory work with diffusion? So diffusion is a biology topic um, it's not quite the same. No, this is equilibrium. So diffusion, um, I think you've actually already covered it in biology. Um, so remember that's something moving from a higher concentration to a lower concentration. And osmosis is about water um, and it always moves down a concentration gradient. So no, not quite the same as equilibrium. So temperature here, um, this is a bit more tricky to understand um, and it's all to do with what happens in reversible reactions. So before we kind of tackle this slide and what it's saying, let's just recap um, what we covered yesterday with a reversible reaction. So if we take the reaction of the Harbour process, for example, which is nitrogen reacting with hydrogen to produce ammonia, and we know it is a reversible reaction, Let's say that, for example, um, this reaction is endothermic in the forward direction. So that means nitrogen reacting with hydrogen produces ammonia and it's endothermic in the forward reaction. So that reaction is endothermic. That means that when nitrogen and hydrogen react together, they produce ammonia and that ammonia or the temperature um, around the ammonia will be decreased because the ammonia will take in energy because it's an endothermic reaction. What does that mean about the reverse reaction? So what does that mean about um, um, ammonia breaking down to produce nitrogen and hydrogen? What do you think that means? Yeah, it's exothermic. So if a reaction is endothermic in one direction, it's exothermic in the opposite direction. And that's a really key thing to understand with reversible reactions. And that only applies to reversible reactions. So if it's endothermic in one direction, it's exothermic in the other. If it's exothermic in one direction, it's endothermic in the other. And the way that questions will tell you is they will write down the enthalpy change for the forward reaction. So what that means is in this case, if for example, I didn't tell you it's endothermic, they would say that the enthalpy change or the overall energy change, again, we covered that last week, will be, say for example, positive 32 kilojoules per mole. 
And does anyone remember what does positive mean versus negative? What does the positive energy change mean? Endothermic, excellent. So positive means endothermic and negative means exothermic. So that's what you're looking for. So when they tell you the enthalpy change, they will tell you the enthalpy change of the forward reaction. So in this case, that enthalpy change refers to nitrogen reacting with hydrogen to produce ammonia. And that is an endothermic reaction. Good, so someone said positive means endothermic, negative means exothermic, excellent. And if you're confused about that at all, please go back to last week's lessons um, where we looked at bond energy calculations and I go through that in a lot more detail. So let's look at temperature then and how it affects a reversible reaction at equilibrium. So if the temperature is increased, the system tries to cool down. So it favors the endothermic reaction. So let's think about that. If we increase the temperature of a system, Effectively, we want to decrease it to, to get back to equilibrium, so to counteract that change. The only reaction that decreases the temperature is an endothermic reaction, because remember, in endothermic reactions, we take in energy from the surroundings, which means that the temperature of the surroundings decreases. So that's why the first one, if we increase the temperature, it will favor the endothermic reaction. So the answer to these questions is not the same as saying it will shift to the left or shift to the right. You need to say it will either favor the endothermic reaction and then in brackets, whether that's the forward or the reverse reaction. So in the case that I gave, I said that the harbor process is endothermic. It's not, it's actually an exothermic process, but that was the example I gave. So if we continue with it being endothermic, is the reaction, if I increase the temperature, going to favour the forward reaction, so nitrogen plus hydrogen becoming ammonia, or the reverse reaction, so ammonia breaking down to hydrogen and nitrogen? So if I increase the temperature, remember it's going to favour the endothermic reaction. Good, it's going to do the forward reaction, not the reverse. I said the forward reaction is endothermic. Um, in actuality, it's not, but it's just for this example. I said that the forward reaction is endothermic. So if we increase the temperature, it's going to favor the forward reaction, i.e. the endothermic reaction. And the opposite is true if we decrease the temperature. So if we decrease the temperature, the system tries to heat up. So we want to heat up the equilibrium um, because we're at too low of a temperature. And to do that, we need to favor the exothermic reaction because remember in exothermic reactions, we give out heat. So we need the heat from the reaction. And so that's why in this reaction over here, if we um, decrease the temperature, it would favor the reverse reaction or the exothermic direction. So let's look at this one here then. So the first one, so what do we think will happen if I decrease the temperature? So first of all, what type of reaction is the forward reaction? So it's saying the enthalpy change is positive. What type of reaction is the forward reaction? Endothermic, excellent. So someone's saying they don't know, that's absolutely fine. So to know what type of reaction the forward reaction is, we look at the enthalpy change. It said the enthalpy change is positive, that means it's endothermic. If it says it's negative, that means it's exothermic. As I said, if you're not familiar with this, um, we went over it last week in lots of detail um, and that will hopefully help you. Um, so yeah, the forward reaction is endothermic. So if I decrease the temperature in this reaction, are we going to favor the forward reaction, which is endothermic, or the reverse reaction, which is exothermic? If I decrease the temperature, what do we think? Remember, the system wants to counteract the change. Excellent, the reverse reaction. And the reason for that is that if I um, decrease the temperature, the system's gone cold, it wants to heat up. The only reaction that heats up is exothermic. So we need to favor the exothermic reaction, which in this case is the reverse reaction. Um, someone's asking, can we do a science quiz um, on quiz.com near the end? Um, I'm sorry, I've planned out this lesson, um, but maybe I can incorporate that into a lesson next week. Thank you for letting me know. How do you tell if it's endo or exothermic? Um, as I said, you look at the enthalpy change and the enthalpy change is the overall energy change of a reaction. 
So this is saying that the overall energy change of the forward reaction is positive. And the reason for that, just as a quick recap, is to calculate the, end, uh, the enthalpy change, we look at the forward reaction, sorry, the reactants. And remember, when we um, go from reactants to products, we break the bonds in the reactants. And breaking bonds is an endothermic process. So we look at the amount of energy to break the bonds in the reactants. So let's just say that's 500. We then subtract the amount of energy given out when we form our products. So forming products is an exothermic process. And let's say that's 300. So in this reaction, if we do 500 minus 300, we get 200. So that means more energy was taken in to break apart the reactants than was given out. So the overall energy change of this reaction is endo, uh, sorry, yeah, is endothermic. It's endothermic, it's positive. And that's how they calculated the enthalpy change. And as I said, we did lots of questions on this last week. How do you know how many kilojoules it is? Again, it's all about the bond energies. We covered this last week. Each specific bond um, has answers for it. Yes, all um, past lessons are on the, My YouTube, uh, on the My Tutor YouTube channel. There's a playlist for chemistry um, and you can watch those. Um, and last week we looked at bond energies. So excellent to everyone that answered the first one. So now let's look at the second one. We've got calcium oxide reacting with water to produce calcium hydroxide. We're told the enthalpy change is negative. So what type of reaction is the forward reaction? It's exothermic, excellent, well done. And that's because it's negative. So if I increase the temperature, which reaction are we going to favor, the forward or the reverse, if I increase the temperature? Brilliant, the reverse. And the reason for that is the forward reaction is exothermic, which means it gives out heat. So if I want to cool the system down, because remember I just said I increased the temperature, that means I need to favor the endothermic reaction. And in this case, that is the reverse reaction. Um, so well done. Okay, any questions on temperature? Um, someone keeps asking if we can do a chemistry quiz on quiz.com near the end. Um, as I said, unfortunately, this lesson has been planned out and I don't have time to do that today, um, but I'll try and incorporate it next week. Okay, so an exam question then um, on temperature changes. So have a go at this question and tell me when you get your answer. So again, we're looking at the harbour process. Okay, so someone's saying, I think this is an exothermic reaction. Excellent, really well done. The enthalpy change is negative. So that means the forward reaction is exothermic. So they're asking, would you choose to use a high or low temperature? So we want the maximum percentage of ammonia. So we want to know which, um, what would we choose to do? Low temperature, excellent. Why low? Does anyone know? Why do we choose low? So the forward reaction is exothermic, so why do we choose low? Good, because exothermic prefers a low temperature. So what that means in this case is that if we want more ammonia, we need a low temperature so that it favours the forward reaction. If we had a high temperature, it would favour the reverse reaction, the endothermic reaction. But to favour the exothermic reaction and therefore the forward reaction, which produces ammonia, we need a low temperature. So in the harbour process, we use a low temperature. Someone's asking, how do you notice if the enthalpy change is negative? There'll be a negative sign there. So here you go. Sorry, that's been cut off, but that is the negative change there. 
Um, excellent. Well done, everyone. Okay, another question then. So this is incorporating both temperature and pressure. What do we think? So what would be the best conditions for increasing the yield of methane? Excellent. So the first one is if we increase the pressure, really good. And the reason for that is there are four moles on the left and two moles on the right of gas. So there's one plus three, one plus one makes two. So there's four moles on the left and two moles on the right. So if we increase the pressure, the position of equilibrium will move to the right and therefore we'll get more methane. So yes, the first thing we should do is increase the pressure. What about temperature? It's a negative enthalpy change. What do we think? A low temperature, excellent. And the reason for that is because it's exothermic in the forward reaction. So if we want to favor the forward reaction, which will produce methane and water, we need to have a low temperature because exothermic gives out heat. So to have a low temperature, it will favor the exothermic reaction. So the answer to this question was to increase the pressure and lower the temperature. Um, so well done to everyone that gave me those answers. Okay, so we've come to the end of dynamic equilibrium and altering conditions. So the next thing we're going to do is a recap of everything we've covered this week, um, and then hopefully we'll have some time to do a few exam questions. So this is a quick recap of how to calculate the rate of a reaction. So any ideas, anyone can take me through a step-to-step -step guide how we calculate the average rate of reaction between two and 10 seconds. Yeah, I like the person that said along the corridor and up the stairs, um, you're on the right track. Um, yeah, I do mean microseconds. The reason I wrote seconds there is because usually they will ask for your answer in centimetres cubed per second. So just imagine this is centimetres cubed and this is seconds. Okay, so the first thing we need to do is remember the equation for the rate of reaction. So in this graph, we've got a production of gas. So that means we need to know how much gas is produced, so gas produced, in what time. So we've been told it's between two and 10 seconds. So that's a total amount of time of eight seconds. So 10 minus two is eight. And then we just need to use the graph to find out what volume of gas was produced. So if we look at the scale between zero and five, there are 10 boxes. So that means every two boxes represents one. So that means two is here. And so that is here, which we'll say is 10. It's not, it's about 9.5. So if you want to put it as 9.5, we can. And then eight, again, um, will be here. So that is here. So that is 29.5. So what's the total volume of gas produced? 9.5 to 29.5, what's the total volume? 20, excellent, very well done. So to work out your answer, it will be 20 divided by eight. So what's 20 divided by eight? 2.5, excellent, really well done everyone. So the answer to this question would be 2.5 centimeters cubed per second. And again, if you want to do more questions like that, um, go to Monday's lesson, um, and that's when we did lots of these questions. Oh, yeah, sorry, I found the um, uh, volume at eight seconds. Uh, that's because I wrote eight here, but yeah, it should be the volume at 10 seconds. So sorry, it should be here, which is 32. So it should be 32 minus 9.5 divided um, by eight. Um, really sorry about that. That's just because I wrote eight down. So yeah, the answer would be 2.8 um, centimeters cubed per second. Um, so well done to whoever spotted that. Okay, so then let's go on to everything else that we covered this week. Um, and the first thing we did was collision theory. 
and we looked at the effects of surface area, temperature, concentration and pressure on rates of reaction. I'm not going to read out this table, um, it's for you to have a look at and if you've got any questions to ask me now, if not um, we'll move on to some exam questions. So just have a look, make sure um, you're happy with it um, and it all makes sense. If it doesn't make sense I'll try and answer it now, if you need more theory on it we covered it in a lot of detail yesterday. What are the two factors that affect collisions? So the two factors well, um, that affect collisions or that increase the rates of um, reactions are an increased frequency of collisions and increased energy in collisions. So all four of these factors will affect one of them. So surface area, for example, increases the frequency of collisions. Temperature will increase both. So it increases the frequency of collisions and it increases the energy in collisions. Concentration and pressure increases the frequency of collisions. So it's those two that um, will be increased or decreased um, when we change the surface area, temperature, concentration and pressure. Any other questions on collision theory? The person that's asking me, is dynamic equilibrium in synergy? Which exam board are you doing? Um, okay, so if there are no questions on this, the next table um, is a summary of everything that we've covered today. So it, it's not in synergy of AQA. Um, AQA, it, the exam board um, dynamic equilibrium comes under the whole topic we've been doing this week, which is rates of reaction, um, collision theory and um, equilibrium. It's not synergy, but it is a higher tier topic. Um, and this topic is in all of the exam boards. Um, so this, as I said, is a summary table of everything we've covered today. Any questions on that? No? Okay, let's do some exam questions. So this is directly related to what we covered today. What is meant by a closed system? Someone's asking me um, if I can slow down while I'm explaining. Um, the reason I'm speeding over these last few slides is because they're a recap of everything that we've covered today. Um, as I said, I'm not reading the tables out. It's just for you to have a look at and see um, if there's something that you're struggling with. I've gone through everything in a lot of detail, either in yesterday's session or today's. Um, so good. Um, so what is meant by a closed system? Any ideas? We covered this right at the beginning today um, when I showed you the recap slide from yesterday. Okay, so a closed system means that neither the reactants can get in or the products can get out. So it's like having a closed box. So when we reach equilibrium, if there are gases, we don't want them to be able to escape. So we put them in a closed system. And same with reactants. If for example, in a reaction, we've got oxygen in there. If we don't have that as a closed system, oxygen from the air will come in and react. So a closed system basically means neither the reactants nor products can escape or get in. Whatever, whatever is in there will stay in there. Explain why when a reversible reaction reaches equilibrium, the reaction appears to have stopped. What do we think? Why does it appear to have stopped? Good, no change occurs. So we're at a balancing point. The rates of the forward and reverse reactions are equal. So there will be no change in the amount of product or reactant. So it's not about the reactants and products being equal. It's there'll be no change in the amount of product or reactant. Um, so well done to people that gave me answers to that. Excellent. Okay, 
So a bit um, of a cover, covering of what we did last week. So first of all, does anyone remember where the activation energy is on this energy profile? Does anyone remember how we draw the activation energy? Any ideas? Where's the activation energy? Yep, it is a vertical arrow and it will go from the reactants up to the first peak. So that's the activation energy. You can abbreviate it as EA. So that is it there. How does this diagram show that the reaction is endothermic? Any ideas? Everyone that gave me um, an answer for the activation energy, well done. How do we know that this reaction is endothermic? Excellent, someone said the energy of the products is higher than the reactants. So remember, so energy of products is higher than the reactants. Um, this is just a one mark question, so that would have got you the marks. And remember in endothermic reactions, energy is taken in from the surroundings. So that's why the products have higher amounts of energy than the reactants. Okay, so this is directly related to what we did today. Suggest what would happen if any, increasing the temperature will have on the amount of hydrogen iodide at equilibrium. So this is the reaction. We're told it's endothermic. So what will happen to hydrogen iodide if we increase the temperature? So this is hydrogen iodide. And we're going to increase the temperature. What will happen to the amount of hydrogen iodide? Excellent, someone's given me a really good answer. They said that amount of hydrogen iodide decreases and that's because equilibrium moves in the direction of the endothermic reaction. Really, really good, well done. So essentially it favors the forward reaction. Yep, so I'll write a model answer for that. So um, the, um, oh, the amount of hydrogen iodide will decrease because the reaction favors the endothermic, you can say forward um, reaction um, in order to decrease the temperature. The amount of hydrogen iodide will decrease because the reaction favours the forward reaction in order to decrease the temperature. Well done. Okay. So we're told that this forward reaction is exothermic. So it's the reaction of um, ethene with steam. It's exothermic. Use Le Chatelier's principle to predict the effect of increasing temperature on the amount of ethanol produced. So ethene reacts with steam to produce ethanol. We're told that the reaction is exothermic. So it's exothermic. What will happen if we increase the temperature on the production of ethanol? So that's the reaction. It's exothermic in the forward reaction. What happens to the amount of ethanol if we increase the temperature? Good, well done. Someone said um, the right answer. Good. Yeah. Good, okay, so the ethanol will decrease as an endothermic reaction will occur. So again, um, the ethanol will decrease as the system will favor the endothermic or reverse reaction. Um, in order to decrease the temperature. So it's just important that you say that the reason it favors that reaction is to decrease the temperature. 
Good job, everyone. Um, as, I, as I should probably say at this time, is any Q&A questions that you have, please put them into the Q&A chat box. Um, we've got about five minutes left for today. If there's any questions from my tutor specifically as well, um, I'll try and answer those. This is, today, uh, this is this week's last session as well. So if you've got any questions before next week, um, please pop them into the Q&A box. Explain how increasing the pressure of the reactants will affect the amount of ethanol produced at equilibrium. So if I go back, we're increasing the pressure. So let's have a look. What, will that, uh, what effect will that have on the amount of ethanol? So we're increasing the pressure. What effect will that have on the amount of ethanol? Um, yes, I do do private lessons. Um, my tutor does have private lessons on there. So all the tutors on my tutor will give private lessons in a range of subjects. So if you go onto the my tutor website, you can find out more. Um, there's lots of different tutors on there for pretty much all subjects that are available. So what will happen if we increase the pressure on the amount of ethanol? Good, I've had one answer so far. Someone's asking, is there going to be further maths lessons soon? If you stay signed up on the online school, you'll get updates on that um, whenever new lessons come out. Good, so ethanol will increase as there are more moles on the um, left rather than the right. So excellent. Um, so there are two moles on the left and one mole on the right. So that means if we increase um, the uh, pressure, the position of equilibrium moves to the right. You can say there are fewer moles of gas in order to reduce the pressure of the system. There you go. Great, well done everyone. Okay, what do we think about part A? Yes, I'll try and incorporate a quiz next week. Um, I do tend to do quizzes in most of my lessons. Um, I didn't do one today, but I did do one on Monday and Wednesday. Um, I'm not sure what you mean by quizzes, if you just mean kind of multiple choice questions or online quizzes. Um, just let me know and I'll see if I can incorporate it next week. Okay, what type of online quiz are we looking for? Okay, interactive quizzes online, fine. Yep, I will try and incorporate that next week, that's fine. Good, so explaining why changing the pressure does not affect the yield of hydrogen, it's because there are the same moles of gases on the left and right, so it will stay at equilibrium. There's two on the left, two on the right. Okay, um, why is the best yield of hydrogen at equilibrium is obtained at low temperatures. So it's suggesting, so they're not gonna tell us the answer. Why do we think the best yield of hydrogen might be obtained at low temperatures? Good, so essentially, if we um, obtain the best yield of hydrogen at a low temperature, that means the forward reaction must be exothermic. And so if we have a low temperature, it will favor the exothermic reaction. So essentially, the answer to this question is because the forward reaction must be exothermic. Well done, everyone. OK, last question then. Um, the temperature used in industry needs to be high enough for the reaction to take place. Explain in terms of particles um, why the rate of reaction increases when the temperature is increased. So rate of reaction question about collision theory. Does anyone remember what effect temperature has on collision theory? Or how that relates to collision theory? If not, I'll write it out. Good, the hotter the temperature, the faster the reaction. Great, it increases the frequency of the collisions and the energy of the collisions. That's excellent, really well done. Um, so yeah, it's all about, first of all, um, if we increase the temperature, the rate of reaction increases. And the reason for that is that when we increase the temperature, the particles have more energy, so they will collide more frequently. 
and um, because they also have more energy they will collide with more energy and the third thing you can say is that because they also have more energy more of the reactant particles will have more of the activation energy or will exceed the activation energy so the reaction takes place quicker um, well done um, so have a lovely bank holiday weekend um, everyone and i'll see you for the first lesson next week which is monday at um, 9:45. Um, take care, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. Um, bye.